including stick sparklers are included, not metal rod sparklers though. Uh, poppers are actually now legal. Believe it or not, they were illegal for a long time. Uh, there's only two narrow windows in the calendar year when retailers can sell them. But New York citizens are allowed to own them or use them basically at a Again, it's not stuff that flies up in the air, not stuff that goes back. But the ground mounted fountains and things like that. CO detectors in commercial buildings. Who's feeling the bite from that one? Uh, mandatory requirement. So it uh, went into effect in December of last year. Uh, transition period, June 27, 2015 through June 27, 2016. So basically all of your commercial buildings at this point should have carbon monoxide detection and alarm unless there's no carbon monoxide sources in the building. So if you have, if there's no cooking facilities, you have all electric heat, there's no fuel gas being used, there's no oil, no solid fuels being used, if there's no carbon monoxide sources, you do not need to put detection in. But an attached garage or any cooking appliance that uses fuel, gas, fuel oil, solid fuels, would require that you have carbon monoxide detection in your commercial buildings when your transition period is over. Some of you may have entered into an agreement with your local jurisdiction where you gave them a, a plan. We can't do it all at once, but here's our plan. We're going to have it done by. And you had to get work started, and, and you have to diligently pursue and all of that. But basically, any commercial building in New York State that has a CO source in it should have CO alarm and detection. Uh, the uniform code update, which is really what we're kind of here to talk about. We've been running a nine-hour program since, oh, last December. It was probably our first couple dry runs. Uh, we're making major changes to New York State's regulatory process with regard to our code. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to show you what the new books look like, what a couple of the changes are. Um, that was adopted in March of this year. The ultimate effective date is October 3rd. So in the Building Code Act, when we make a code change, there's, there's provision for a six-month transition period. So it was adopted in March. They decided that the transition period would end October 3rd. Between now and October 3rd, and this is not including the Energy Code, this is only the other eight books in the Uniform Code. Between now and October 3rd, if you apply for a permit, the regulated party, which is the applicant, gets to choose new regulation or current regulation. <coughs> Starting October 3rd, if your application is received on or after October 3rd, <coughs> you will be bound by the new regulation. So it's kind of neat the way that works out. Some folks might like what's in the new regulation and say, you know what, review my application under this, uh, especially if you're building a deck. I gotta be honest with you. The restrictive <coughs> provisions for decks in the new residential code are awesome by comparison with what we have right now. Uh, solar is a little more restrictive, I'll be honest with you. Because now you gotta provide areaways, access ways, things like that for fire guys. There's no more covering roofs from edge to edge with solar panels top and bottom. You gotta leave room for venting and things like that, access for emergency services. Uh, energy code update. There's no transition period for energy. That's based on a, a different law. <coughs> the Uniform Code comes from the Building Code Act. The Energy Code comes from the Energy Law. And there's no transition period built into that. What the Code Council did do when they adopted it in March said, you know what, we're going to give it the exact same effective date as the rest of the code. So that kicks in on October 3rd. Between now and then, you would use whatever we already have on the board. Just a, an idea of the types of things that we get to do up in Albany. So that group regulatory affairs, this is what they're usually buried in. It's the, the background details on all this stuff. All right, there it is, trust type construction. Um, and again, this isn't just trust type construction. It includes engineered wood products. It actually includes things like post and beam construction. I believe they included that because the bolts and the heavy metal plating used on some of those uh, 
heavy, heavy timber style buildings actually bring heat deeper into the wood basket and cause structural failure. So I think that's one of the reasons that was included. Uh, engineered wood products, I don't think I have to tell any of the builders. Uh, TJIs are nice. You can carry uh, great spans with them. They can give you a nice appliance, stiff floor. But in fire conditions, any firefighter can tell you they just don't last very long. And the science bears that out. <coughs> so, truss construction has some similar issues. Metal plate connected trusses can fail at the plates pretty easily. So we identify trust type construction now. This includes residential buildings as well, including one and two family and townhomes. So uh, became effective last January 2015, initially adopted as an emergency rule, and it was plugged into a place called we, we call 1228. Became a permanent rule May of 2015 with an effective date in June. So it's a little bit shorter transition period. Um, it lives in 19 Niker Park 1265. That's where the text of the rule is. And I'm going to show you a couple of slides from our website so you can find where these rules are, so you can actually read entire rules if you'd like. Uh, so it's all done by the Building Code Council through the Building Code Act. And our uniform code, this is not the energy code, the uniform code, which would include this, applies everywhere except New York City. When they wrote the Building Code Act, they exempted, uh, the state exempted cities with a population over one million from mandatory compliance with the state code. Uh, we only have one of those in New York. Buffalo came close for one census cycle, but their population dropped back off after a couple of big businesses shut down. There we go. So, notice of adoption. This is actually from our website. They always publish a notice of adoption. Trust type, pre-engineered wood or timber construction, residential structures. And it breaks down what the rules are and that it doesn't apply in New York State. Okay, the full text is available on one of our web pages. This is the bottom half of that. Uh, so, rule text available by clicking here. We have a lot of hyperlinks on our website. It makes it very easy to find stuff. If you actually want to read the full text of the rule, See exactly what the definitions are, what's coming. All right, so for one and two family dwellings, townhouses, group R occupancies, which could include hotels, motels. Uh, actually, the hotel motel stuff is regulated in Part 1264. That requirement's been around for several years now. So the, uh, the symbols that you see next to doors, emergency exits, uh, anywhere the fire guys might see it. Uh, Siamese connections, where they hook up to the sprinkler system or the standpipe system. That's uh, that's very similar to what we see for the homes. Okay, so construction type. We have five basic construction types in the code. Type five is wood frame construction. Uh, the letters on the bottom, F and R, stand for the floor or roof. So if you have only floor trusses, you would put an F. If you have only roof, roof trusses, only an R. This would be a wood frame building that has both floor and roof trusses. So, readily available online. Actually, if you go to any search engine, type in trust signs, you'll get lists and lists and lists, often broken down by state. And you can just get whatever you need. So, pretty easy to obtain, pretty cheap. Uh, this is the notice that's supposed to be filed with the permit application for, um, I would say, residential code buildings, one family, two family townhomes which is what the newer rule applies to. Notice of utilization of trust type construction, pre-engineered wood or timber construction in residential structures. So that's the form you have to fill out and file with the local jurisdiction if you're proposing to use those materials in a new home. CO protections and alerts for commercial buildings. That does include restaurants. That's actually one of the uh, cases that spurred it. Applies to restaurants, all commercial buildings, it is retroactive. It applies to not only new, but existing buildings as well. Okay, and that was that time frame we saw that ended this past June. At the end of this June, everyone was supposed to be in compliance. So if you have a commercial building that has a CO source, which could include things like HVAC systems, heating systems, or commercial cooking equipment, you're supposed to have these things in place by now. Okay? The exception, if there's no CO emitting appliances. 
So if you don't have a CO source in the building, you don't have to worry about the alarms and the detector. I'm sorry? The manufacturers of the units will tell you how far it needs to be away from the whatever is emitting the carbon monoxide. If you put it too close to the appliance, you're going to get false alarms. Not where you have a source creating the CO2 in a separate ancillary garage. If it's attached to the building, there is a way for CO to get into the building. Carbon monoxide basically is a byproduct of incomplete combustion. So if you can find a, a way to burn fuel completely, 100% of the time, you won't get any carbon monoxide out of it. Every time it kicks on, there's a puff of carbon monoxide. Every time it shuts off, there's a puff of carbon monoxide. Every time you don't maintain your system with your equipment, and they're not burning efficiently, they are creating carbon monoxide. And that some of that is going to get the environment we build in. And most of our buildings we're building today, especially commercial buildings, are closed systems. We don't have drafty old houses being built anymore. Everything's tight now. So carbon dioxide is an increasing problem. We're seeing a lot more issues with it. New York is actually ahead of the curve on getting the uh, detectors into buildings. The rest of the country's got to catch up to us. So that's kind of nice, actually. Quick question. Yes. What you know is requiring these to be hardwired and to they have to be digital? Uh, there's no requirement for digital. If it's new construction, they should be hardwired. If it's an existing building, the regulation actually provides for allowing battery operating. Is there anything uh, regarding the type of battery? The battery? <clears throat> uh, I can tell you the 10 year batteries are preferred on them, but not specifically required. And, and from a building owner or building maintenance standpoint, 10 year batteries are a beautiful thing. You don't have to remember to change them twice a year. Now, what's the light time? Uh, one of the downsides to CO alarms is they have a shorter lifespan than uh, smoke alarms do. Smoke alarms, smoke detectors generally have a 7 to 10 year warranty. So at the end of the warranty period, that's the manufacturer's way of telling you, you should be replacing this now. Okay? They're willing to stand behind it 100% until the end of that warranty period. That's your signal. That means you should probably be replacing it when the warranty is gone. Not only won't they stand behind it, there's a good possibility it's not going to work right anymore. CO alarms tend to have three to five year warranty periods. Uh, the, the element in them that senses CO degrades over time as well as exposure to carbon monoxide. So you have to really be on top of that stuff. That's another one of your building maintenance issues. You know, like you got the sprinkler guy comes in a couple of times a year and does his thing and the alarm company comes in, they do their thing. So this is going to be right up there with the alarm stuff. Uh, and be aware of things like those expirations. How about residential buildings? Uh, single family, two family? Yes. Single family. Uh, oh, res apartment buildings. Yeah, they're required there if you have a CO source in the building. So if your building's all electric, how about the individual units uh, having a gas stove? Gas stove would kick in the requirements, yes. yes. An existing building, our, our residential code lays out, actually it's in the fire code, lays out exactly where they're required under what circumstances. It's uh, section 915 of the fire code. <coughs> John, if I could just interject, we have a monthly newspaper called Impact. If you go to buildersinstitute.org, our website, and hit on the July-August link for impact, there's a page one story detailing this from A to Z, listing tutorials, government contacts in Albany, etc. If you can keep that in mind, that'd be very, very helpful. It's a great, great resource. Go ahead, John. Sorry. I like that. I like that. You guys are staying on top of things. That's good. We're trying. That's what we like to see out there. Uh, the more you folks stay on top of things, the easier the code official's job is, the less conflict you have with them. So that's always a beautiful thing. I, I always tell my students, and I don't know how, how well it sinks in, uh, number one for code officials is educating the public. Because John Q. Public doesn't know what's in the code. The code officials spend one week a month for six months having this stuff pounded into them. 
and then we give them a test at the end of the week on what we taught them that week. So they're the ones who have the knowledge about what's in the code, where to find it. A big part of their job should be educating people, not just throwing paper at it and saying you're in violation, you're in violation, but explaining what's in violation, why it's in violation, what they can do to remedy. So I, I hammer that into my students a lot. I, I'd like to believe it's getting out there and, and the guys are doing that, the gals are doing that. Uh, but if a code official is not forthcoming with information or just says things like, oh, it's a violation, you figure out what part of the code is a violation of, call Erica, because that's not the correct response. They should be, if they, I, I tell them all the time, if you're going to write it, be able to cite it. If you can't quote a code section, hold off before you start calling it a violation. And if you're going to call it a violation, you've got to be able to point to some place in the book and say, here, this is what you're in violation of. So if they're not doing that, then you need to call Erica's office and say, listen, the guy says I'm in violation, but he won't tell me of what. Can you help me out here? Uh, that's their job, is to let you know exactly what section you're in violation of. So you can look at it and see what you have to do. All right, thank you, our uniform code update. So we've got a transition period in place right now. It started April 6th, it ends October 3rd. If you submit an application for a permit between now and October 3rd, and it's deemed complete before October 3rd, you get to choose the current code or the one we're about to put in place. It's the regulated party that gets to choose. If you submit your application on October 3rd, you're going to be bound by the new regulation, period. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Okay? Uh, 19 NICAR, again, that's the Secretary of State's Codes, Rules, and Regulations. It's parts 1219 through 1228. So 1219 is what we call the New York State Uniform Fire Prevention Building Code. It's one paragraph long. It says it shall consist of, and then it lists the different volumes that comprise our uniform code today. So part 1220 is the International Residential Code, as modified by the New York State Supplement. Part 1221 is the building code. All the way down the list till you get to the existing building code, which is part 1227. Part 1228, if we adopt a regulation in between code cycles, mid-cycle, they park it in 1228 until it can be put into the main body of the code. So the CO regulations went into effect a year and a half ago. They lived in 1228 until we produced a supplement from the 2016 Uniform Code. Now it's going to live in uh, Section 915 of the Fire Code. And you'll find the details in our supplement. And I'm going to show you where to find the supplement. Okay? The International Codes, Building Code, Residential Code, Fire Code, Existing Building Code, Plumbing, Mechanical, and Fuel Gas. I usually lump those together and call the Equipment Codes. And Property Maintenance Code fun little document. All as modified by the State Uniform Code Supplement. And that's a 189-page document. Uh, it actually modifies eight books. So it's not a horrendous number of changes that we made for New York State. And I'll be honest with you, about half of it is changes to the residential code. And most of the changes we made to the residential code is to keep stuff we already have. Okay. Uh, the way we deal with existing residential code buildings, much different than the rest of the country. We're keeping our Appendix J intact. Only a couple of changes to it. Uh, pools, be they residential private pools or commercial pools. Those regulations are born in the health code, not even in the uniform code. So our uniform code just defers to Department of Health regulation and mimics a lot of what they have. So we're keeping our own pool regulations. Uh, a lot of things like that, sprinkler requirements, we're not changing those for residential homes yet. We're keeping what we have right now. The International Code requires all single family homes, all two family, all town homes to be sprinkler. Uh, New York State says, yeah, if it's three stories, sprinkler. Other than that, we're not going to force it. We're keeping that same rule. We're one, one family, two family town homes. Uh, again, it applies statewide except New York City, it's cities with a population over 1 million that are exempt. 2016 Energy Code, we 
which again is based on a 2015 international energy code. That's actually part 1240 of 19 NYCRR. So it's still in Secretary of State's regs. Uh, residential and commercial provisions. You can find both in this document, 2015 International Energy Code, recognizes the 2013 version of the ASHRAE standard. That's what the federal government deems a minimum standard. And the federal government mandates, and they tie funding to it, but they mandate that every state adopt an energy code that's at least as restrictive as that ASHRAE standard. Uh, New York State's maintained uh, compliance with the federal mandate, large part because there are funding mechanisms that are tied to that mandate. So you may know that your local building inspectors get uh, free copies of code books every time we do a code update. Well, at least twice, those books were funded by energy grants. And the only way we accessed those grants was by being in compliance with the federal mandate. Uh, NYSERDA. Most of NYSERDA's funding comes from federal money because New York State stays in compliance with that mandate. So there's a lot of good reasons to have it. Uh, it all comes from our energy law, which I'll be honest with you, our energy code predates our uniform code, our mandatory uniform code. The energy law was first adopted in the 70s. The uniform code went into effect in the early 80s. So we had about eight years or so where insulating your building was required, but you may or may not have had a local code you had to follow. Kind of interesting the way that worked out. Does anybody remember the uh, mid-70s? The OPEC embargo? Mm -hmm. Okay, gas lines. You guys oh, yeah. have gas lines down here. Up by us, we didn't really have gas. I'm from the Catskills. I grew up, anybody remember the Concord Coaches Hotel? Yeah. I grew up right between them. We didn't have gas lines until you folks came up for the summer. Of course, then we had gas lines everywhere. John, there were two gas situations back in the 70s. It was one in 73, and then it got bad again in the summer of 79, if memory serves me correctly. And that's actually when we adopted our energy code was yeah. late 70s. Remember that. Uh, the 73 was when OPEC went ballistic. That's right. And then in the late 70s, there was some other stuff going yeah. on that complicated as well. That's when we adopted our energy law. Right. Didn't adopt a building, a mandatory building code until the early 80s. Legislation was adopted in 82. The code went into effect in 84. So, <coughs> the energy thing? It always is. It still is. We shouldn't have to pay that much for gas, honestly. Uh, the thing about the energy law, it did not exempt any part of the state, so it does include New York City. Uh, if you're in one of the five boroughs, you are bound by New York State's energy code. All right. Um, previously, since about 2002, uh, New York State has been taking the international codes, making our changes to them, in some cases literally crossing stuff out, writing in margins, and then sending that to a publisher and publishing codes of New York State. So you may have seen them or have them in the office, the building code of New York State, residential code of New York State. This time the codes council said, no, we're not going to do it that way. What we're going to do is we're going to adopt the 2015 international codes outright with a limited number of New York State modifications. So if there's something we've changed in the past, and somebody in Codes Division thought it was important, they had to submit a proposal to the Codes Council and justify that New York State change. And if they couldn't justify that New York State change, it went away. Okay? So we gave up on a few things with this code adoption. Not all of our New York State modifications stayed in. Some of the more critical ones did, and I think some of the ones that benefit most of the people in this room. Uh, we had begun the process in about 2012 inside the office, looking at the newly published international codes. Uh, our, our 2010 codes were based on their 2006 editions. It took us a full cycle just to get it adopted. So by the time our 2010 code went into effect, the 2009 international codes were already out there, and the 2012s were headed rough draft to the printers. And they were already looking at code change proposals for them. 
By late 2014, the Codes Council said, you know, these 2015 international codes have already been published. We're already a half a cycle behind on the 2012s. So they directed Codes Division to have staff members review the 2015 codes, do a comparison between that and the 2012s, which they were contemplating adopting. And that's exactly what happened. We did a staff review in-house. We kept anything required by statute, anything that could be justified by the people who wanted to keep it. How are you? Okay? They didn't convene new subcommittees, technical subcommittees. They literally had staff do it in-house. Uh, and the end result is we're not going to have New York State books this time. We're going to have the 2015 International Codes and a supplement, the Uniform Code supplement for the Energy Code. <coughs> So all the New York State modifications we found in the supplements. I usually compare the supplements to the filter in a coffee machine. Okay, you put the coffee in the filter, you run the water through what comes out on the other side is a good cup of coffee. If you know how much coffee you put in the filter, right? Uh, you take the international code, you run it through our filter, our supplement. What comes out on the other side is a good code from New York State. Okay, and there's a few different ways to, to slice and dice that. Okay, we're not we're gonna we did pick specific printings of the international codes. So you're probably familiar a little bit with the idea of publishing, and you know there's typos, there's errors and omissions, and almost anything that's ever published. Read a newspaper up to page two. I guarantee you're gonna find a typo somewhere or something that was incorrect, right? Well you can imagine with two thousand pages of code text with literally thousands of cross-references and tables and footnotes, there's mistakes, there's errors, there's omissions, there's uh, references that didn't get updated when they moved the code section. So when somebody finds one of those in an inter international code document, they send an email to the International Codes Council, ICC. And the first response you get is always the same. Nope, that's what the code says. Must be right. And then you send an email back, no, no, it's a mistake because, and you explain why it's a mistake. And then a couple of weeks later, you get a second email, usually from someone on that committee, who says, yeah, you know, you're right, that was a mistake. We'll fix that. And they publish something called an errata. Errata is a correction, an amendment. And most of the errata are literally that. It was a typo, it was an omission. Uh, we forgot to update that cross-reference kind of thing. Every now and then, it's a substantial change. They printed a million books. They sold 999,999 of them. They know they have to order more books. They take all the errata that they've received since those books were printed, and they put that, those corrections, those updates, into the code books. And when they order the next, it's a second printing. And then after the second printing starts to wane down a little bit, they're ready to order more, they take all the new errata they got. And they end up with a third printing or a fourth printing. So New York did adopt specific printings of each international code book. And I'm going to show you the list coming up. Uh, sometimes it's a third, sometimes it's a fourth. Okay? So we have specific printings. And then all the New York State modifications are found in our supplement. The whole point was to expedite the regulatory process. The ultimate goal since 2002 has been to get the international codes to the point where we could just adopt them outright and not have to have New York State changes. It's never going to happen 100%, but we've gotten very, very, very close. Uh, there are literally thousands of code changes every cycle. New York State has their hand on almost every one of them. We have people on almost every committee of the International Codes Council. Uh, the majority of code change proposals that are submitted are either sponsored or co-sponsored by a New York State representative. So we have a very heavy hand in what goes on at the ICC level, as well as what happens to our own codes here in New York State. And they have an electronic means to participate now, too, which is kind of cool. So, <coughs> This is just a, a couple of samplings of different things that uh, we have in our supplement. Okay, plumbing fixture maximum flow rate. Kind of interesting because New York's one of the states in the nation that really doesn't have water bills. 
My best friend lives in, uh, just outside San Diego in Southern California. Uh, they can't harvest rainwater in Southern California. It's actually a crime. It's against the law. They need every drop they can get in the ground to recharge the aquifers. Here in New York State, here in Westchester County, I'm sure you love it if people harvest more rainwater. Yes? They're, they're getting there. Uh, I think that's the biggest one on the planet now, right? Yes. Uh, soil lumber grading practices. New York State has allowed ungraded, basically locally sawn lumber, under specific conditions for a long time now. It's one of our New York State modifications to the code. So we have a certificate that's supposed to be filed by the Sawyer, all that good stuff. Uh, accessible dwelling units. We make some modifications with regard to those. Not too many because that's another one of those federal mandates. We have to be, if anything, more restrictive. Uh, I asked Eric what she meant by a type B plus dwelling unit. So a type A dwelling unit is a dwelling unit that's fully accessible. Somebody who is mobility impaired could move in, not have to change a thing. They've already got the high toilet. They've already got the grab bars. They've got wide enough everything, big enough room spaces. Type B dwelling unit is what the codes call an adaptable dwelling unit. So the bathroom is big enough, there's blocking inside the walls to add grab bars, but it's got a standard toilet and there are no grab bars on the walls. But spatially it meets all the functional requirements for an accessible unit. So a type B unit is an adaptable unit. I, I got the impression from America a type B plus unit is an adaptable unit that does have some of the bells and whistles plugged in already, just not necessarily all of them. So that's, I don't know how much you folks get to deal with accessibility issues. Uh, I know that's a hot button issue all over the country. Uh, do you think New York's the only one in, uh, business is getting into lawsuits? No, it's all over the country. So, uh, accessible parking spaces and access aisles. In the federal accessibility regulations, a five foot wide access aisle is acceptable in most cases. And then under certain circumstances, you have to put in what's considered a van accessible or eight foot wide access aisle. New York State does not recognize a 60 inch access aisle and never has. New York State has always required all handicapped parking access aisles to be a full eight feet wide. Or what the feds would call a van accessible access aisle. So we've always had that and keeping it. I'm not sure how they justify it, but we are keeping it. Well, I, th I think. Um that in New York State, the access aisle is eight feet, but we don't have banned parking spaces. So all parking spaces for accessibility exactly. are wide and the access aisle is wide. Right. Right. The, the banned accessible language actually comes from the ABA itself. And New York State says, you know what, just make them all eight foot. Uh, gas station fire suppression systems. This is the canopy systems. You may have seen the nozzles sticking down out of the canopies. New York State's required those for several years now. We will no longer be requiring those for new construction. For an existing station that has them, they have to maintain the system. If they want to remove it, they have to file for a permit. They're going to have to upgrade their entire fuel delivery system to new equipment in order to allow them to remove that suppression system. So if anybody here has got a gas station, don't go and disable your canopy system just yet. You'll need a permit. You'll have to do a lot of work before you can do that. Uh, residential sprinklers, we are not changing the rule we have right now. We currently require uh, one family, two family townhomes that are three stories above grade to be sprinkled. We are keeping that same rule. The International Residential Code since 2009 has required all new residential code buildings to be sprinkled. There's two or three communities down here in Westchester that have required sprinklers since the 80s. Okay, that rule stays in place. That's a local law, it's more restrictive. It was approved by the Codes Council, that stays, doesn't go away. One thing that may change, the Residential Code 2015 IRC does provide what's considered a prescriptive alternative to a fully designed 13D sprinkler system. That's in uh, the plumbing chapter of the Residential Code, section P2904, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. Uh, so, you may not have to get a fire protection engineer to design that sprinkler system for a single family home down here anymore. Uh, you'll have to talk to those jurisdictions. 
as of October 3rd, when this code goes into effect, that option is in the residential code. So it's a prescriptive alternative to a fully designed 13B system. Uh, residential stair geometry in New York makes sense. I'm going to show you what the numbers are. We make a couple little changes to the international residential code with regard to riser height and tread depth. We're a little more forgiving than they are. Uh, air leakage. So this is part of the energy code requirements. Right now we are at five air changes per hour or less, right? It's going to three. Right now you can do what's called a visual bypass inspection of the energy code package. The building inspector can walk through and say, yeah, it looks like you put the insulation in right. It looks like your barrier is complete. Uh, moving forward, starting October 3rd, lower door test mandatory. Duct blaster test mandatory. There's no option anymore. I know I've been telling my students in my coach classes since I started six years ago, if you want a startup business, get certified for lower door test and uh, duct blaster testing because they will be coming as a mandatory requirement pretty soon. And here we are six years later, and that is what we're ending up with. Uh, three air changes per hour is tight. Very tight. Air leakage protocol for R1s, 2s, 3s, and 4s. Uh, there's some modifications for the, uh, like the blower door test in uh, apartment buildings where you might be able to cluster multiple units into a single test on a group. That's actually all based on the old LEED standard. And I say old LEED standard because LEED would barely comply with this new energy code. The newer above code programs that are out there uh, go all the way up to basically a, a net zero building. That's one of the programs that's out there now is a net zero building where you're producing at least as much energy as you're consuming. Kind of a neat trick. All right, our website. This is when you go to Department of State's website and you pick Division of Building Standards and Codes. This is our opening page. This is the top of our opening page. Okay, anytime we do any kind of rulemaking, I had that little graph up earlier, all those different rulemakings are covered in this section. At the end of each one, there's a hyperlink for Notice Adopt. And that takes you to the next page, which is where we have all the different rules that are either in process or recently adopted. You click on that, it takes you to that specific item. Okay? Here's our uniform energy, uniform code and energy code update. It lists the different books here. If I were to scroll down on this page, there's my code list right down here. The supplements, uniform code supplement, energy code supplement. Okay, the currently approved versions are on the website. There's a few items that are still being adjusted. Some things that came up after all this they thought was over with. Uh, some cross-referencing that was missed. A couple other odd end issues. So the Codes Council is looking at making some more adjustments. As they make them and a supplement gets replaced, the replacement will show up on the website, the same place. We're always going to try and keep the most current information we can available on the website. Okay. Uh, also on the website, there are links to free looks at our code books through the ICC. I'll show you what that looks like coming up. Okay. But if you click on the Uniform Code Supplement, it will bring up a 189-page document that looks something like that. That's the cover page for it. And then there's all the New York State changes. Uh, I say 189 pages, about half of the text is qualifying language. <coughs> Section blah blah in the international whatever code is being repealed and replaced by, and then you get code text. So if you actually took only the code language itself, it would probably be 100 pages or less. Over eight books, that's actually pretty impressive that that's all we're changing, over eight books. And again, about half of that residential code. So not, not huge changes that New York State is making to the adopted codes. Uh, this is the table of contents from the supplement. So one thing that will never change in New York State, chapter one of the uniform code is always going to be New York State specific. 
If I open up an international code, their chapter one is going to tell me how to set up a building department and a fee schedule. Uh, it's going to discuss parameters for granting variances. That's not the way New York State operates. New York has a statewide uniform code enforcement program. So our administrative and enforcement provisions, we're always going to have our own unique chapter ones. So our chapter one replaces chapter one in all eight of the code books. And then there'll be a specific scope for each code document in there. It's kind of a, an interesting setup. From there down, these are the exact same order as the regulation that recognizes them. So I mentioned earlier, part 1220 was the residential code, part 1221 was the building code, all the way down to part 1227. Is, these are in the same exact order as the regulation. So that's a convenience for everybody. Uh, that last chapter, reference standards, we have reference standards in our code. Basically, it's an authoritative document like the sprinkler design standards from NFPA. NFPA 13, 13R, which is for things like apartment buildings, and 13D, which is for one and two family dwellings. Those are considered reference standards, literally hundreds of them. We may recognize a different year edition of a standard than the international codes, or we may have a statutory requirement to list a specific edition in the uniform code. Our reference standard chapter is in addition to and to supplement the reference standards in all the various code books, not completely replace them. All right, this is the very beginning of our supplement language. Title, scope, and purpose is always where code books start. So I told you I was going to give you a slide that showed you which printings of the code books we adopted. IRC, second printing. IBC, third. Plumbing, third. Mechanical, fuel, gas, fire code are all third printings. Property maintenance code, the smallest book in the entire series. They're up to the fourth printing rate. In the smallest book. Go figure. Uh, existing building code, they're up to the fifth printing. And I'm not sure why. Just little things. A cross-reference got this, something like that. Okay? All amended by our uniform code supplement. I, I screwed up. I should have brought a copy of that with me so you could have a peek at it. There's some good stuff in there. Uh, the ICC website, which is, uh, I'm trying to remember, it's something like uh, ICC.org, or no, ICC Safe, one word, ICCSafe.org is the International Code Council. You can get to them through our website. There's actually a link to the free view of New York's codes. When you go to the New York page at ICC, International Building Code, third printing. Plumbing Code, third printing. Existing Building Code, fifth printing. They put on their page the printings that we adopted. They did that as a courtesy to New York State. They do not include our modifications. This is their as published code books. Doesn't have the New York State specific stuff, but they were kind enough to put together a page that offers the correct printing of each code book. And as a matter of fact, if you wanted to buy a set of codes, they will sell you what's called a New York set. So it has all the correct conditions to be in compliance in New York State. Uh, we have a very good working relationship with ICC. Very good working relationship. Okay. Somewhere. <laughs> I actually don't know where the main office is. I want to say they've got a main office in or near Washington, D.C. Oddly enough. Uh, they hold their code hearings all over the country. Um, you can access them remotely from that CDP access. I didn't really talk about that much. Uh, but you can join the International Code Council. You may not be able to be a voting member because you're not a government entity. But you can join and participate in the process and have input into code changes make code change proposals if you want. Uh, but if you go to iccsafe.org, you'll be able to look at all the options you have as far as buying books or becoming a member. One advantage to membership is you do get a discount on their books. And they don't just publish 8 or 10 code books. Uh, they actually have things like a wildland interface code, uh, international zoning code. Uh, for each of their code books, they'll publish what they call commentaries where it explains what certain code provisions are trying to say. And 
and they kind of use layman's language, so it's a little more understandable than what I usually call code speak. You know, they call it a code for a reason. You're not supposed to be able to understand a code, right? But they do have our New York State set. All right. Our residential code of New York State. It's going to be the 2015 IRC is modified by our New York State supplement. So we'll have Chapter 1, provision specific to the residential code, a specific scope for it. And then Chapter 2 of this document is our changes to this document. So it's pretty well organized. I, I kind of like the way they put it together. Uh, and then just a couple samples of things. Uh, a couple of definitions that probably changed if they didn't exist before, or if they existed before or are brand new. Access roof, ground access area, roof access point. A lot of this has to do with solar mount, or roof mounted solar displays. Making sure emergency services can access the roof vent if necessary, all that good stuff. You know, solar panels are a funny thing. I can turn off disconnects at ground level all day long. If light's hitting that panel, guess what? It's still making electricity. So that becomes a big issue for fire service when they have to vent the roof. Or when they have to get up there and move around. Or drag a hose line. Or almost anything else they have to do. So we've got some good regulations in building as well as residential code. And fire code as well. Uh, New York changes. Section 324 of the residential code. Again, this has to do with roof access points for emergency services with regard to solar happens to live in Chapter 3 of the Residential Code. Uh, swimming pools, spots, and hot tubs. If you knew our 2010 code, that was all regulated in Appendix G for single-family homes, two-family townhouses. They literally took Appendix G and moved it up into Chapter 3 of the Residential Code. I, I mean that literally because when they did the first draft, they didn't even renumber it. So the appendix stuff is always A, in this case it would have been AG. Appendix G, and then a section number. So the first draft of our supplement, when you got to section 326, it was AG this, AG that. They never even changed the numbering on it. So that was, they had to go back and renumber it all to R326. Uh, with electrical bonding on gas systems, anybody familiar with corrugated stainless steel tubing? Flexible gas line? The industry came out with something they call CJ, CSST, which is a uh, conductive, jacketed, corrugated stainless steel tubing. And the manufacturer says, you don't have to bond it anymore. Look, we did this. New York State said, yep, that's cool. We're keeping our bonding requirement even when it's CJ, CSST. We're not abandoning it just yet. We're not completely comfortable with their conductive jacket. I mentioned this earlier. Appendix J is where we regulate existing one-family, two-family townhouse built townhomes. Uh, so there's breaks built into it, so you don't always have to come up to new code standard on everything. Our Appendix J is much different than what's in the International Residential Code. We're keeping our Appendix J with very minimal change. One of the few changes we're making actually has to do with CSST. It's not changing very much at all in Appendix J. Uh, so, I mentioned the stair geometry stuff, the riser height tread depth. The published IRC puts riser height at a maximum of 7 and 3 quarter inches and minimum tread depth at 10 inches. New York State, we allow 8 and a quarter in residential construction for riser height and keeping. We allow the tread to be not less than 9 inches instead of 10. With that, we also say, by the way, you have to have a nosing. The nose, minimum nosing is, oh yeah, one and an eighth. So we pretty much end up in the same place anyway. Funny the way that one works out. But the eight and a quarter inch riser height, it's not that big a deal. I know we went with seven inch for commercial buildings to, to mirror the IBC a while back. But with residential, we've always been a little more forgiving, right? So we're keeping our eight and a quarter. Uh, a couple of things that are new this time around in the IRC. They modified the definition of attic. Okay, so it's now it's an unfinished space between the ceiling assembly and the roof assembly. Okay. They added a definition for something called a habitable. <coughs> and we'll show you some slides later on that kind of show you what a habitable attic might look like. 
finished or unfinished area not considered a story complying with all the college requirements. So what they're saying is that we're not going to call it an extra story above grade if you have this habitable attic. And realistically, you can end up with almost a five-story unsprinklered single-family dwelling and still be in compliance with the International Residential Code. So this is actually one of the issues that Coach Council is revisiting. Excuse me, whether or not we want to keep that. We shouldn't have McDonald's on the way down to the uh, we, we have to figure out if we're going to keep that one or not. This idea of a habitable attic not being a story. Uh, door size. You know, sometimes a change is more semantic than anything else in most cases. So our current code says that you have to have at least one exit door in a single family home. It has to be at least 36 inches wide. The new 2015 residential code says not less than 32 inch clear opening, which is the same language you find in the building code. Ours, theirs, everybody uses that same language. An exit door has to provide a minimum 32 inch clear opening. That's between the door stop and the inside face of the door when it's at the 90 degree angle. So what they really did was they took the specific three foot width requirement for the door, supplanted the building code language of a 32 inch clear opening with the door at the 90 degree position and builders in the room, how big a door do I normally need to get the 32 inch clear opening? 36 inch door, because the door itself and the hinges sticks out into the opening a little. Could I get offset hinges that maybe a 34 could work? Sure. You could spend a little bit more. Uh, but in most cases, standard installation, it's probably still going to be a 3068 door that goes in. But the language says 32 inch clear open. So a subtle change. Like I said, in most cases, probably semantic. One thing New York State has not adopted previously that the IRC has had for a very long time. Window fall protection. Not a lot of homes have window sills below 24 inches off the floor. Right? Most of our window sills are a little bit closer yeah, to waist height in our homes. If you have windows with a sill height less than 24 inches above finished floor. And have a six foot drop on the outside, six foot or greater. You actually have to limit how much the window can open in normal day to day operation. And there's a few different mechanisms to, that can accomplish that. There are, there are easily removable stops, uh, easily removable guards that you can put on windows. And that's what the code is calling for in those very limited circumstances. So if you don't like the idea of restricting the size of the opening, Set your sills more than 24 inches above the finished floor. You don't have to worry about it. Provisions about little kids falling out of windows and getting their necks and legs broken. Okay? So that's the origin of it. That's sill or satchel? That's the sill. So that's what they have to get past. It's the sill. And yet, yeah, toddlers, it's less than 24 inches above the floor, very likely they can fall out of the window. So that's when this kicks in. It talks about. Uh, not allow a four inch diameter sphere to pass through. Again, builders will recognize that language when we talk about stair guards, okay, how far apart the balance they're supposed to be, that sort of thing. So it's the, the, that same concept about kids not being able to fall through or get trapped. And that's a couple of examples, right? So I've got a, my finished floor inside, I've got less than 24 inches to the window sill. There are some, uh, ASTM F2090 is a standard for a removable device that would act as a guard in the opening. Um, this is actually something, it's like a little clip right on the window frame. Uh, a lot of newer windows actually have stops built into them. So it will open almost all the way. Uh, there's like a three inch block of rubber up there, similar to one of those. Little kids can't open the window far enough to, to accidentally fail out. This is just silly in my mind. Uh, stuff all the way down the floor like that. But people like glass. Complicates the structure. People like glass. Automatic fire sprinkler systems in the published IRC, Section 313. We're removing it entirely. We're putting in New York State's language. Three story above grade. The only thing we're keeping from their language, Section P2904, is that alternative prescriptive alternative I told you about to a 13B system. 
So we are going to keep that. We're going to keep that language in the plumbing chair. Uh, so that's now in play. That'll be uh, starting October 3rd. That's the language that's in our code. Between now and then, applications. But it's certainly better than having an FPE design and a fire protection company install a fully designed 13 system. And they put it in the plumbing chapter because chances are who's going to put that system in? It's pipes and water. Uh, right? 13D is a very de minimis system anyway. So in each case, uh, townhouses, one or two family <coughs> could use that P2904. If you want to pay somebody to design a 13D, that's fine. You wouldn't have to. Uh, the habitable attic issue that we talked about, I know I gotta wrap it up. I'm pretty close to done anyway, but I gotta talk fast. So ultimately what you could end up with. I've got an above grade basement, first story, second story. I don't need sprinklers yet. Habitable attic, I still wouldn't need sprinklers. And I've effectively got four levels of living space. So, Coach Council's taking another look at that one. Uh, we did produce a lot of homes were elevated after Irene, Lee, and Sandy. The state did produce a technical document on when you would have to add sprinklers to an elevated dwelling structure. Okay. When would we get that habitable attic? Uh, if you check back on the website, you follow the Coach Council's activities. That's where we always post stuff. It's right on our website. We're going to be before October third. No, they won't make a decision on that before October third. So this is kind of space we're talking about with habitable attic. That's what you normally think of when you think of a habitable attic, right? The slope ceilings. There's, there's no maximum. <coughs> Excuse me. No maximum square footing requirement? Right. That's part of the downside to it. And I, I'll talk to you after if you want, but I, I've got my own mixed feelings on it. So, uh, IBC moving forward is going to be a 2015 International modified by our, our supplement. Uh, if anybody was familiar with our, our height and area table, <coughs> commercial buildings, that's going away. We're not going to have that moving forward. International code broke it down into three separate tables. Okay, I don't know how many of you are going to be thrilled about that one or not? Um, sprinkler threshold for assembly occupancies. This is for A ones. We used to say occupancy load of 100 or more required sprinklers. For A one, A three, and A four occupancies, it's actually going up to 300. Staying at 104 A2s. A2s are our restaurants, bars, nightclubs, and playhouses. Eating and drinking establishments. Other than that, uh, house of worship, uh, sporting events, theaters. It's actually going to be bumping up to 300 for new construction. Uh, plumbing code. They added some language for something called a family or assisted use toilet room. It doesn't replace unisex toilet rooms, but it's now a, a viable alternative in some cases. Okay, that's what the eight code books all look like, or excuse me, nine, energy's in there. That's the published international codes, as modified by uniform and energy code supplements. Okay, there is an energy hotline, NYSERDA in conjunction with TY Lynn. Uh, has been authorized to provide a hotline for energy code questions. It's specific to energy code. Okay? So they are out there, 518-377-9410. And uh, Newport Ventures is involved in that. So it's code coach, one word, at newportventures.net. I'll leave that up because the next slide just says questions, and it's dinner time. Do we have time for a couple of quick questions? I'll take whatever. I'm driving. Does back anyone have any County, questions for so John? The longer I wait, the less traffic there is. <laughs> There's Gene right there. Do you have the knowledge of regulations that are being considered gray water? Uh, gray water, honestly, you're going to have to look at Department of Health regulations to find rock solid answers on that. Uh, there are provisions in the, in the international codes regarding gray water, but because it is sewage, doesn't have solid matter in it, but because it is sewage, it is regulated through the Department of Health. So you want to talk to, I guess Westchester County probably has Department of Health. By the way, I've got some cards I'll leave on the table as, as everybody's getting ready to leave, but I am going to take some questions. 
Well, yes, the Department of Health has the great water rights. So if you file for a revision on an existing set of plans after October 3rd? Revision to an existing permit. Uh, in most cases, they're probably, probably, as long as they're not major, if it's pretty minor stuff, they'll probably let it continue with the same code. Um, somebody had asked me before I got started about if you pick up a building through like a foreclosure or something that has an expired permit, you're probably going to have to refile for a new permit at that point. Yeah, you probably want to just file under the new regs if it's after October 3rd. If it's substantially complete and it's going to be an economic burden, talk to the local jurisdiction first. If you think they're being unreasonable or incorrect about something, you can ask them to get uh, the regional offices involved, which in this case would be Eric down here. So uh, we try to make transitions as smooth as possible, but you can't cover every contingency. I'm sure most of you are aware of that. So that's why we have uh, basically pressure relief mechanisms built into the system. Thanks for one more question. The door door has an energy dump last night. Are those going to be for new construction only? Yes, that's new construction. Not remodel, not addition. Uh, remodels depending on extent of remodel. you got to look at how much work you're doing, when it's going to kick in. Uh, and that you start again with the local authority having jurisdiction and, and sit down and see if it's going to hit that threshold or not. Uh, new construction, absolutely. And by the way, third party, like the blower door test people, always has to be acceptable to the local authority having jurisdiction. So it's got to be somebody that knows what they're doing. It's got to be somebody that's properly certified to do that type of work, meet the correct qualifications. And then if they are a problem, if the code official finds that they're falsifying documents, things like that, he cannot accept them if he chooses not to accept them. So it's always going to be acceptable to the local authority having jurisdiction. Anyone else? Okay. Yes. Well, we have one more. Sorry. The sill height, yeah. What is that? Full force and effect, no question about it, October 3rd. That's in the 2015 residential code. Between now and then, uh, it's the regulated party that gets to choose. So the applicant or the builder gets to choose. If your permit's already been issued, your plans are already approved, you are building to the code and the plans that were approved at the time of approval. Uh, New York is not big on retroactive to begin with. Usually if we require something after the fact, it's pretty easy to accomplish and pretty cheap. We, we don't like to do big retroactives. We're not going to go back and make everybody put sprinklers into an assembly space that didn't require them when it was built and stuff like that. Uh, maybe an alarm system you know, or something else. But for, uh, retroactive requirements, smoke alarms, CO alarms. And if you're not ripping walls and ceilings open, put in battery operated. How friendly does it get, right? Uh, one thing we made mandatory for a lot more occupancies a handful of years ago, handheld fire extinguishers. It doesn't get any easier than that, right? You're not ripping anything apart, it's not a huge expense. That's the kind of stuff our coach usually make right away. Anybody else? That's it, That's they're it. hungry. Yeah. They want John, dinner. John Drovers, thank you very much. Cool yeah. Excellent job. Excellent job. Excellent job. If you parked in the hotel,